Welcome back, uh, everybody. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to chair this uh, session for this afternoon. And this will be given uh, by Florian Marquardt from the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Life in Erlangen. And he will be talking about reinforcement learning. So please, looking forward. Uh, thank, you, Mar thank you, Marcus, for the kind introduction. So um, I want to get an impression of uh, who you are. <laughs> So how many of you have already trained a neural network? Yeah, most of you. How many of you have some experience in reinforcement learning? OK, there's a bunch. Maybe you keep quiet when I ask the questions to the audience. So uh, this lecture is supposed to be relatively uh, interactive. So from time to time, there will be questions that I ask. And then you will be asked to discuss with your neighbor uh, uh, and come up possibly with an answer. But let's uh, just get started. Um, this is a famous example that I want to briefly mention. So what you're looking at is, of course, the board game of Go, one of the more complex uh, board games, even though the rules are extremely simple. But you can put these white and black stones uh, at any point on the board. Um, and you try to encircle the opponent's areas in some way. The details do not matter. Uh, now, all of you probably know that in chess, computers have become better than the best human players already in the 90s. Um, in Go, this was not yet the case. And the reason was that in Go, you have so exponentially many more possibilities of placing these stones. So it was believed until a few years ago, actually, that it would still be quite a time until computers became better than humans in this uh, complex board game. Nevertheless, uh, back in 2016, uh, the company DeepMind that most of you are aware of, they released a computer program based on neural networks, and in particular based on this general set of techniques called reinforcement learning. And this computer program was able to beat the best human players. In fact, this uh, success was so sensational that one of these world's best human players uh, made this remarkable uh, uh, comment. So I uh, let you re read it. But uh, basically, he was saying that um, he would go as far as to say that not a single human has touched the edge of the truth of the game of Go. And only by seeing the computer program play, finally, humanity that has played this game for, I don't know, <laughs> thousands of years has finally understood that there are better strategies out there than those that have ever been invented by humans. So these obviously are strong words, and we will learn how this set of techniques works and how it can be applied. Now, since you already had some introductory lecture on neural networks, um, most of what you've seen really goes under the heading of supervised learning. So supervised learning, you can think of as having a very smart teacher. This teacher knows all the answers to all the possible questions. And he gives uh, a sampling of these question answer pairs to a student. So he says, OK, if you asked uh, this question, in which country does Trieste lie, uh, you have to answer Italy. And if you ask this question, then you have to answer that, and so on. And eventually, the uh, student will be able to imitate the teacher and maybe even extrapolate slightly from the answers given by the teacher so that the student can also answer some questions that were not in this uh, training set but maybe they cannot be very far removed. Okay, And so very obviously here, the final level is probably limited by the level of knowledge of the teacher. The student cannot become much better than the teacher in this setting. However, if you want to become ambitious, if you are an ambitious student or, let's say, a scientist, you certainly want to become better than your teacher. Eventually, you want to become better than I am in reinforcement learning. So how do you do that? And so the only... <laughs> general technique we know is basically trial and error. So uh, if no one tells you what is the right answer to a problem, you try out one thing, you try out another thing, and you again fail in it. You try out a third thing, and maybe in this third attempt, you get something a little bit right. Huh? And then you keep this strategy of solving a certain problem, and you start to modify it a little bit to see whether you can do even a little bit better. So in a way, it's trial and error combined with this concept that if you have encountered a reasonably good strategy, you try to modify it and you try to reinforce 
the good actions that you have taken. So that's the origin of the word reinforcement learning. You reinforce good strategies and make them even better. And here, hopefully, the final level is unlimited because there is no teacher. There is no one telling you what to do step by step. You're finding it out on your own. Okay. So at the, its heart, reinforcement learning is really about discovering strategies, strategies to solve problems. For example, for a self-driving car or a robot to solve the problem to go from here to there uh, in the shortest possible route. And there is no teacher who's already telling you uh, which steps to take. You have to figure that out on your own. So you would uh, observe the immediate environment, maybe because the robot has a camera built in, and then the robot has to decide whether to move to the left or to the right or uh, forward. Um, but again, no one will tell you what's the right solution. Famously, as I just mentioned, you can apply this strategy discovery to the domain of games. So in a game, you would observe the board, let's say the Go board, and you would have to decide where to place the next stone. And again, there is no one teaching you uh, what to do, but you certainly know uh, when you have done right at the end of the game, because that's when you win. And then in physics, we can uh, measure a quantum system, let's say, observe uh, things, and depending on the observations that we make, uh, we apply certain controls, maybe we um, send in some microwave fields to the quantum system, or we uh, control a complicated plasma fusion reactor by changing the electrical currents and the coils that control the plasma. And again, this is of the same kind. And again, there would be no one telling you what is the right strategy. You don't want to just imitate a known strategy, but you want to discover the strategy that is best to, say, preserve the quantum information for the longest possible time in your quantum computer or to uh, stabilize the plasma for the longest possible time. So this is all about uh, reinforcement learning. And so here's a picture of how you would imagine this to be in the quantum realm. You have your, um, what we will later call an agent here depicted as a neural network trying to steer the quantum computer to do what you want it to do. Okay, so let me start by telling you about the basic setting of how we formalize this set of challenges when we think about reinforcement learning. How do we even think about reinforcement learning? So you see here a little robot roaming around the world and maybe interacting with the objects in the world. And from the point of view of a computer scientist, you would uh, abstract everything away and say, the little robot I call my agent, it's an agent because it can decide to do things on its own. It's not purely passive, it can really act. And the rest of the world I call my environment in the sense of reinforcement learning. So it's, uh, whenever I talk about quantum physics, it's uh, giving rise to some confusions because in quantum physics, as many of you know, uh, uh, you talk about environments when you think about dissipative quantum systems and you have a little qubit and it's interacting with the environment of all the rest of the world that leads to dissipation. Here that's not the case. The environment is really already everything besides the agent. And the agent is trying to do something with the environment. And so the kind of loop, the feedback loop we are thinking about in reinforcement learning goes like this. The agent observes the environment. Maybe it has a camera, or maybe it only gets a few sensor inputs. And based on this observation, it now has to decide, as I said before, what's the next action? What should I do? Again, in different scenarios, there will be different actions available. In this scenario, when I have these blocks that I can stack, maybe I can move a robot arm, or I can decide which block to stack upon which other block. So, these are all actions that will eventually also change the state of the environment. So I take in the observation, and I try to map the observation to the next suggested action, and then I will take this action. The environment will therefore change. I will take in the next observation, and so on. And this mapping from observation, from the observed state of the environment, to the next action that I want to take, that's called a policy. Or you could also call it a strategy, but in this field it's called a policy. So a mapping from state to action. And then you go on and on and on. And the thing, that, the thing that you need in the end is to define what is good, what counts as good. 
and that is where the so-called reward comes in. But let me make it really clear in this uh, setting. Again, I have a robot uh, moving around a two-dimensional world. Maybe it wants to pick up these boxes. And so the state that the agent takes in might just be the position of this robot as measured in its coordinates. That's one possible choice of a state. It could also be this full image that we are seeing. That's another choice of a state. And depending on which choice of state you make, what kinds of observations you have, you can do more or less. For example, if these boxes are always at exactly the same three positions, whenever I start this game, they're at the same positions, then it is sufficient, possibly, to give as a state the current location of the robot. And it will eventually, during training that we will discuss, figure out a good path to move between these, uh, between these boxes. However, if these boxes can be at arbitrary locations, every time I restart this game, they are at a different location, and it would not be sufficient for the robot only to know its own position, because it also wants to know where are the boxes in order to plan ahead and figure out the best path towards these boxes. In that case, you would want the observed state to be the full image, for example, or maybe the distance to the boxes. Maybe it has a kind of radar built in. So depending on what is the state, you can do, you can solve more or less complicated problems. And so that's one of the first things you have to decide when you decide to do reinforcement learning. What's the observed state that my agent is supplied with? Maybe there are physical constraints because you have built this robot and it doesn't have a camera and only a kind of echo sensor or something. Um, and maybe there are also constraints because uh, once you get this state and feed it into your agent, it has to process it somehow. Maybe this agent is a neural network. And if it's overwhelmed by the state information, maybe that's also not good. So, okay, that's the state. And then the action in this example would be pretty clear. It can just move into the four different directions. So these are the actions it can decide on. But in order to, yeah, in order to teach it what you want it to do, as I said, this is not supervised learning. You will not tell it in each individual step, oh, now it would be good to move up. Now it would be good to move to the right. Yeah, that would be supervised learning, and there would be no reinforcement learning necessary. You could do this if you know the strategy, but if you don't, then it's not a good start. So in order to formalize what you want it to do, you have to give it a so-called reward. You have to tell it, okay, whenever you do pick up a box, you get a reward of plus one, and if you pick up all three, you get plus three at the end of the game. And so there's at least a little bit of indication what you wanted to do without revealing any strategy because you haven't figured out the strategy on your own. You just want to say what is the desired end state. Okay, is this so far clear? That's the setting of reinforcement learning. Seems clear, I see nodding, so yes. So at least we know what we want. The question is how we get there. Okay. So, the first thing I already mentioned, the correct action is not known. This is not supervised learning. We have to do something else. And I already mentioned the idea. Uh, we give an indication of what we want in the end by giving a reward. For example, in this board game of Go, you get plus one if you win the game, minus one if you lose the game. That's at the very end. Or in this game of picking up boxes, uh, the reward depends on the number of boxes that you picked up, say, in a given time. And the question now I want to pose to you is how could we optimize the reward? Yeah? If you don't know anything else, um, and maybe those who know about reinforcement learning, uh, they should not participate now, but get together with your neighbor and discuss, maybe based on things that you have learned before in this uh, series of uh, days of lectures, um, how could one go about optimizing such a reward? If you don't know anything else, yeah, but you're faced with this problem. You know there's a reward that is defined. You know you can take actions. Um, how would you go about it? Maybe you discuss for five minutes. I'm sure you will come up with some at least naive solutions. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, really get together and discuss, even if you don't come up with a solution. <laughs> really please discuss with your neighbor if it's in any way possible and just think about it concretely. There's this little robot at each time step. It can move four directions. It wants to find only one box that's already good enough. It will get a reward. Maybe just for a few time steps it moves. So if you don't know anything else, if you want to brute force so solve this problem, what could you do? Okay, so maybe still one minute and then we wrap it up and then I will ask for suggestions.
Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's discuss. I saw there were um, vigorous uh, discussions among you. So who wants to call in and have some suggestion of what you should do if you don't know anything about this reinforcement learning business? What's the simplest things that we could do? Anyone wants to volunteer something? Yes? Mm -hmm. Ah, interesting, okay. So I think you're already one step ahead. So um, so I think you, you were thinking initially about just doing random walks and seeing whether you hit something, right? That's the starting point, that's the most naive strategy. And maybe if you do hit something, maybe you have stored this particular kind of random walk and then at least you know, oh, this sequence of steps will take me to the target. But of course it's super unlikely if these trajectories are long and the targets are rare that you hit the right thing. You are trying already uh, to improve on this, right? So you're saying, I don't want to always return back to the same old places that I have already visited. I want to avoid them, so I spread out quicker, and, and that's uh, definitely, that's a definitely good, uh, better exploration strategy. Uh, anyone else wants to uh, volunteer anything? So previously in these lectures that you had this week, uh, when you wanted to optimize something, I mean, machine learning is a lot about optimization, right? Uh, what did you typically do? What's the go-to technique when you want to optimize a cost function or something? Huh? Gradient. Yeah, gradient descent. Now here, of course, you see already maybe it's a little bit tricky because the actions are discrete. How can I even take gradients? So that will be one of the topics. So we have already identified two topics first. Brute force for such problems is super difficult because even in each time step I have multiple actions. If I have 100 time steps, I have, I don't know, four actions to the power of 100 possible <laughs> choices, so it's completely hopeless. And it gets even more hopeless if the state is not uh, just the location or something, but you take in a full image because then for each possible image you have to tell me what is the action. And that for maybe for each possible time step, so, so it's completely hopeless. We already see this, so there's an exponential explosion in what we have. Um, and also we just uh, discovered that gradient descent, which we really like, is maybe not so immediately applicable huh? because typically often these are discrete actions. And so we have to deal with both of these problems now. Fortunately, yeah, so, so this is just the same thing. So fortunately, we do not need to invent this at this point because it was invented already 30 years ago. Uh, how to deal with that, such things. And so there are actually two big approaches, policy gradient and Q-learning, that I will discuss in this lecture and uh, still part of the next lecture. And then more recently they have become merged in order to give even more powerful approaches. But let's start with policy gradient. And this is a technique that was invented um, already around 1990. And as the name already implies, we will do some gradient descent, but we have to be smart about it. Okay, so this is policy gradient. It's also sometimes called reinforce. It was invented in 1992. And it's probably the simplest, or together with Q-learning, one of the two simplest uh, general reinforcement learning techniques. I already mentioned something else here, model free. I will come back to that. It's a technique that does not suppose to know anything about how the world behaves in response to your actions. Yeah? So it's treating the world a little bit like a black box. And I now already reveal the key idea. The key idea is that you turn these discrete actions into something continuous by moving to probabilities. You say instead of announcing a particular discrete action deterministically upon observing a state, I will only announce probabilities to take different actions, the probability to move up, the probability to move left, and so on. And probabilities are continuous numbers. And so if you parameterize them, you will end up being able to do gradient descent. So that's one big trick in this business, to turn from discrete to continuous, in this case, by uh, taking probabilities. And so I will now formulate already in words 
what will be the strategy, and then we will derive it mathematically. But what really happens is you take these probabilistic actions, so you move up, you move left, it's like a random walk, but maybe with biased probabilities, so in this location you are more likely to move up than down and so on. You go through the game, and you see what happens in the end, whether your reward was high or not. So it's a little bit like the random walk, but maybe already a little bit smarter. And if the reward turned out to be high for this particular trajectory, you will modify the probabilities. You will modify them in such a way that all the actions you did actually take in this trajectory become more likely, because apparently they were associated with a high reward in the end, so why not make them more likely? Yeah? So if you move primarily up in your trajectory, and that gave you a high reward, because it happened to be that the box is sitting in the upper end of this uh, picture, then you will improve the probability to move up. That seems like a good strategy. Now, if you think about it a little bit more, you will run many, many trajectories, many, many of these biased random walks, and some have high rewards, some have lower rewards, and it will also occasionally occur that um, you have a high reward trajectory that gave you a high reward in the end, but some of the actions you took were actually a little bit stupid. You moved away temporarily and only to return later, so you made a little loop. That's not smart. Yeah. In this prescription, you will also reinforce these action probabilities of the bad actions because they occurred together with a high reward. But don't worry, because statistically speaking, the bad actions will occur more likely in low reward trajectories than in high reward trajectories. So if you average over everything, you're still going in the right direction. Yeah? So in each particular example, you may also reward bad actions, but overall, averaged over everything, it will be good. Okay, so this is in words what will happen, but of course now we will derive it mathematically. Okay, so here's again our little picture, an agent and the environment. But now we already said the trick is to introduce these action probabilities. Yeah? So uh, these are conditional probabilities because they depend on the current state. Depending on the state, I may have a larger probability to move up. And another state will have a larger probability to move to the left and so on. So the way people write this down is in terms of this probability distribution that defines the policy. And I cannot help it, but the name for these probabilities is pi in this field. So pi is not 3.141, but pi is a probability. Um, so pi is the conditional probability of taking action A given the observed state S, which again could just be your location specified in terms of coordinates, or S could be a full picture of your environment, it can be anything. It's conditional probability of taking an action A given the state S, I put little indices here because I want to say this is at time t, maybe at later time uh, I have different states and therefore different actions, okay. And in order to be able to learn, I want these probabilities to be able to change. Now I could take each of these probabilities as its own variable that I can change. And if there are 100 of them, then there are 100 numbers that I can change maybe by a gradient descent. But uh, once the state space becomes really large, like state is an image, or the action space becomes very large, then um, I do not want to just write down an incredibly large table of such action probabilities. Instead, I want to parameterize them, maybe with the help of a neural network. And that's why we put this little subscript theta at the uh, action probabilities. So the action probabilities eventually will be parameterized in some way that I can choose that is arbitrary, need not even be a neural network. I can also just write down some ansatz by hand, uh, but this is the most general thing we can do, and eventually we, we will do gradient descent with respect to these parameters theta. As I'm changing theta, my action probabilities change, and therefore also the trajectories that I will be generating will change. So uh, coming back to the robot, which basically was like a random walk where I give a reward if I hit the right spot. It's really like I'm learning the right probabilities for a random walk, for those random walks that are most likely to generate high rewards, possibly in a very high dimensional space. Yeah. Okay, is this clear? That's the central object of policy gradient because it's the policy and it has a parameter, so we can do gradients. 
Okay, it seems like this is accepted. And as I just uh, mentioned, oftentimes we parameterize the agent in terms of a neural network. So the policy is really a neural network mapping observations to actions. Okay, so uh, to make it clear in the case of the robot, um, if the robot currently is at this position, it will have a table of four action probabilities. The action to go down, up, left, or right, and these are probabilities, they are normalized, and uh, when it then really um, executes a trajectory, it will pick uh, the direction, the action according to these probabilities. Okay, and so here comes a very interesting question. So we're coming back to where we started. So we wanted to optimize the reward, the overall reward that we get, right? And we are now already on track to use uh, gradient ascent, so that seems to be already a good step. But here comes the question. Will we need a model of the environment? Will you have to be able to simulate the environment's evolution for a given action in order to evaluate uh, the gradient of the reward. You want to move into the direction of higher reward. You have made sure that you can at least take gradients because you parameterized your action probabilities in this. So these are continuous things, that's good. But will we need to be simulating the environment's evolution? Huh? And at first, it seems like this might be the case, right? Because if I take this action, if I move up, I get some reward. Huh? If I move to the left, I get another reward. It seems like in order to predict what happens if I change my action probability, what happens to the average reward, it seems in order to be able to predict this, I would need to know what's the effect of the action. If the action is up, then something happens in the environment. If the action is going to the left, something else happens, yeah? So it seems like I need a model of the environment. And that would be scary, because in physics, sometimes we do have a model of the environment. I maybe have the Schrodinger equation for a quantum system, and I can predict what will happen. Uh, but if you think of the board game, certainly I do not have a model of the environment, because the environment includes not only the board and the rules of the game that is deterministic, but it also includes the brain of the opponent. <laughs> and I certainly cannot predict what the opponent will do if I take a certain action. So. So that seems like a still critical point. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go ahead anyway. And at first we have to commit to some way of describing the environment. And the most general way to describe it, which also nicely fits already this action probability business, is in a probabilistic way. So we say, if the environment is in some state S, and I decide to take an action A, maybe the way it jumps to a different state S prime is not necessarily deterministic. Maybe it's probabilistic. Maybe even if I don't apply any action, maybe the environment is doing some funny random stuff, yeah? That could be true. So what people do is they just write down, at least in principle as a mathematical object, this transition function for the environment that says, given that I'm currently in a state S and I'm taking the action A, or my agent has decided to take the action A, where will I end up in? In which states S prime can I end up in? Now, again, this sounds scary because, as I said with the board game of Go, this would be like, I observe the state of the board, I decide which action I take, and then I have to predict, or at least this function would tell me what my opponent does next uh, in order to see what is the state of the board after the opponent takes the move, yeah? That doesn't seem like something I would know. Maybe it can be deduced after observing many, many, many runs of the game and learning what my opponent is doing, but it seems difficult. Nevertheless, let's just move ahead and let's keep fingers crossed that somehow in the end, this will not be a problem. This sometimes happens in mathematics, right? You are uh, manipulating objects that you already know you will never be able to calculate or have access to, 
but they are still good conceptually. Okay. Now we need to talk about trajectories. So for me, a trajectory is just the sequence of states and sequence of actions. So I tell you the initial state, then the agent takes an action, I end up in another state, which maybe follows deterministically, or maybe this environment makes a funny random transition, okay? And so I go through a se sequence of states, and also I go through a sequence of actions. And the entirety of all these states and actions that I define as my trajectory. And whenever I play the game fresh, I get a different trajectory. Yeah? So I play the game of go once and twice and a third time, and every time probably the game evolves differently, so every time I get a different trajectory. And for abbreviation, we call this trajectory tau. So now we can uh, think about things like what's the probability of a trajectory? Of course, this trajectory is a completely high-dimensional vector, yeah? So it sounds even more scary than before, but let's just move ahead. So, what's the probability of getting a certain, of observing a certain trajectory tau when I do play this game many, 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 many times? Well, so let's say we start in a definite initial state, or we could also make the initial state probabilistic, that doesn't matter. So I start there in S0. And then the agent looks at the state S0 and announces certain action probabilities. Okay. Now I take one of these actions according to these probabilities. And based on the current state and the current action, I know in principle that my environment will make a stochastic transition to a new state. So this is in this uh, capital P transition probability that we just discussed. Now I'm in this new state, the agent looks at the new state, again decides on an action, and the thing continues. So step by step by step, I have these probabilistic transitions. Half of the probabilistic transitions are because the agent decides on an action, and half of the probabilistic transitions are because based on that action and the current state, the environment also decides where it wants to go next. And so the probability of going through a particular sequence well, that can be just written as a product of probabilities because these are all conditional, yeah? So I start in a certain state. Based on that state, the agent decides on an action. Based on that action and the state, the environment decides on the next state. Based on that, the agent decides and so on. So these are really all conditional probabilities and to get the full probability, I just have to multiply them all. And so that's what I wrote down here. So uh, the Product is really a product over all the time steps in the trajectory, and I'm taking in this product always a pair of two probabilities, the action probability and the environment transition probability. So you have this long product string. Of course, it's not anything we can hope to easily evaluate and so on, uh, or average over at least, uh, but still. What we can certainly do is we can sample from it, and that will become important, yeah? Because if I start in a state and my agent then announces the action probabilities, I can sample from the action probabilities and commit to a certain action. And then the environment will do whatever it has to do. So it samples from this capital P transition probability. And I don't even need to know that the environment will do that for me. And then it's, again, the turn of the agent. The agent has to decide on the next, next action and so on. So I can certainly sample one trajectory. And then when I get, run the game fresh, I sample the next trajectory. So sampling is OK. Okay, so uh, now I have to introduce something else. Um, we talked about the reward, and now we want to be a little bit more precise. Uh, sometimes I will only announce a reward at the very end. For example, plus one if I win the game, and minus one if I lose the game, and zero otherwise. Sometimes I can also already at intermediate stages give rewards. Yeah? So maybe. I don't know, my robot arm is able to move, but if it moves too fast, it should be punished because it's dangerous for the mechanics and so on. So maybe there are intermediate rewards also at intermediate times, not only at the very final time when I reach some end state. Yeah? And so we call these uh, re rewards, whether they are intermediate rewards or given at the very end, uh, we call them little rt in this notation. For each time step, there could be a reward. And the thing that I want to optimize is, of course, the sum of all these rewards. Yeah? 
So uh, that may consist of this reward at the very end, but also rewards that punish, I don't know, um, doing too many controlled not gates in a quantum computer because these gates are very faulty or something like this. Yeah? So uh, we call this uh, sum over all the rewards the return. That's the language of the field. Capital R is the return. It's just the sum of all the rewards. Sometimes people call this also the cumulative reward function. Okay, so this is the thing we want to optimize. And for each trajectory, it can be easily calculated. You know? that's, that's designed by me, the user. I look at the end state and say, oh, that's pretty close to what I wanted. So you get a high reward. So that's not difficult to evaluate for a single trajectory. Okay. So now, what do we want to optimize? Well, I gave you the expression for the return, the cumulative reward, but that's for a single trajectory. Of course, I'm happy if in a single trajectory I come out good, but then the next time I run the game, maybe I come out bad. I want a strategy that on average gives me a high return, an average uh, a, a, a sum of rewards. On average, over all the trajectories that I'm running, yeah? because otherwise I'm just lucky. Okay, so let's write down the average return. The average return is really just averaged over all these trajectories that we discussed before, and where in principle we know the probability for each trajectory. Okay, so this is done here. So the average return, I will sometimes write it with an overbar or sometimes expectation value of R. That's just, as for any expectation value, the sum over all possibilities, the probability of that possibility times the uh, return as assigned to that. And the possibilities in question here, these are the trajectories. Yeah? So I'm summing over all trajectories, multiplying the probability of a trajectory with a return for this trajectory, and so I get the average return. Yeah? I hope that's clear. So in principle, this is the object we want to optimize. And as you can see from this formula, since the probability of a trajectory depends on this parameter theta, which, which, with which we parameterized our action probabilities, this whole average will depend on theta. And so it makes sense to do, for example, gradient descent, or gradient ascent, rather, because I want to optimize, I want to increase uh, the return. Now, of course, no one can actually evaluate precisely uh, the sum because remember the trajectory is really the string of uh, states and actions and even if I only have two states and only two actions, if the trajectory length grows then I will have two to the number of time steps or four to the number of time steps, different possible trajectories so no one can evaluate the sum. Still we can write it down. And so what we want to do is to try to optimize this uh, return by doing gradient ascent and these param parameters theta. So formally, all we want to do is, just like for the cost function minimization, now we want to return function maximization. So we want to move along the gradient of this, and we want to calculate the gradient for that purpose. So any questions so far? So we have set up everything, and now it's mathematics, and hoping for some good luck that in the end, we do not need an explicit model of the environment. Yeah, please. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so the theta will be the parameters of the agent. Um, in the more advanced cases, it will be indeed a neural network. Um, in simpler cases where the state space and the action space is small, you could even write down all the probabilities in a little table for each state and each action, what's the probability. And then these um, entries of the table itself, they are like numbers, continuous numbers, and you could take them if you wanted to as parameters, so you directly optimize them. Okay. And so now before we go to the solution, here's a little exercise again. So the first question is easy. Can we sample, so let's even forget about where this came from in reinforcement learning. We just say we have a um, probability distribution over certain events J. This probability distribution P depends on some parameter theta, so I can change it. 
and I want to average some observable capital R. So each event, J, has an associated capital R. I want to calculate the average of R. So the uh, direct formula is written in the first line, of course, sum over P times R. And the question is, can we sample this via Monte Carlo? And the immediate answer is yes. Uh, uh, if, if I can sample from this distribution uh, P of J, I'm just throwing dice somehow according to these probabilities, okay, um, then each time I note down what is the current value of R, and I do this 100 times, and I simply take the <laughs> empirical average over these 100 times, and I will get an approximation to this sum. Yeah? So uh, that's what we could call Monte Carlo. So I just sample from this probability distribution. I throw my dice many times and, and average over the, uh, over the results. But then there's the really interesting question. Now I am interested in the gradient of this function with respect to theta, yeah, the gradient of this expectation value that I wrote up there with respect to theta, so the derivative with respect to theta. The question is, can we sample this via Monte Carlo? And again, I want you to discuss with your neighbor, please, and um, think very hard about it. First, you should discover, oh, there's a problem. <laughs> uh, and then maybe you can even come up with a solution. So please discuss this again for five minutes. This is the main trick of the whole, uh, of the whole strategy.
Okay, maybe still one minute and then I take suggestions or insights. Okay, good, so um, is there any insight as to why this is a little bit more tricky? So what's the problem? Can anyone volunteer? What's the problem? Is there a problem? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, let's assume that let's assume that this is not difficult, and I do have an exact expression. Huh? Um, so what I really want is this. Um, why is this still hard? Why is this still not obvious immediately how to sample with Monte Carlo? Yeah. Exactly, so I want, what I want, what I need always when I want to do Monte Carlo is something of this sort, where I have something times the probability. Yeah. Ah, okay, so your trick would have been try to take this derivative and try to rewrite it in terms of a probability distribution. Yeah, unfortunately, this is sometimes positive and negative, so there's already a problem. Um, yeah, any, any suggestions? How to come from this kind of expression to that kind of expression? Yeah, do something by parts. Yeah, that, that's a very good idea. Yeah, please. Multiply and divide, yes, that's, uh, that's basically the same idea, I guess, but yes, multiply and divide. So what I want to do is, I really want to force having a probability here. So what I will do is simply take the rest of this. Divide by the probability, multiply by R, because that was there anyway. And now I can interpret this thing as my question mark, so to speak. Yeah? And this thing I can sample because it's in the usual style of an expectation value. So suddenly I, I don't really evaluate directly this, but I try to sample the expression here. And now this actually is a logarithmic derivative. So you, if you like to, you can write it in this form. It's not different, of course, but it's the same. Okay, so this is uh, one crucial uh, step here. And so we will make use of this. So let's come back to our um, gradient of the average uh, return. So what is shown here is, well, I take the gradient, I pull it in, and then I do exactly the trick that I just showed on the blackboard and that you discovered. Um, and now I still have to evaluate this logarithmic derivative of the probability to have a certain trajectory. Now the trajectory probability itself was this product of many conditional probabilities. Now very fortunately, the logarithm of a product is the sum of individual terms, so that makes things already much easier. And now if I take the gradient of that sum, only those terms will contribute that do depend on theta. And now you look at it and you see, oh great, these environment transition probabilities, they do not depend on theta, so they completely fall out. 
And the only thing that remains are these action probabilities that define the policy. Yeah? So what you suddenly see is that the logarithmic derivative that we do need is the sum over all time steps that simply is generated from this product over time steps. Now I have a sum over time steps because of the logarithm of these logarithmic, uh, logarithmic derivatives of these action probabilities. Yeah? Now these action probabilities, in principle at least I know them. Yeah? Maybe I have parametrized them myself or maybe I've written down a neural network and um, the usual neural network packages can help me to get this derivative of these uh, action probabilities. So that's not so bad. But what's really important is the transition probabilities of the environment have completely disappeared from everywhere except, of course, this initial probability. But that is not so bad because, remember, I'm doing a Monte Carlo sampling and this will happen automatically, so I'm just going through all my trajectories. The environment does its thing stochastically. It samples for me. I don't need to know even these probabilities. The environment samples from its own distribution. And so this is all contained in the Monte Carlo sampling. So this is the important part. In, in, in whatever terms I need to evaluate, the environment does not appear anymore. And in the only term that it does appear, this is uh, replaced by Monte Carlo sampling. So this is the magic. So, so we have seen the three magic steps of policy gradient. First, the idea even to turn a discrete problem into a continuous problem by going from discrete actions to the probabilities of these actions. And, um, and then this idea of uh, how to Monte Carlo sample uh, from such uh, uh, gradient by, by doing this <laughs> multiply and divide trick. And then finally, the observation that in the thing that I'm sampling over, the thing that I'm averaging over this thing does not depend on the environment transition probabilities. And the only place they do enter is uh, where I use Monte Carlo sampling anyway. So is this clear? Yeah? So this is basically already everything about policy gradient. Uh, is this clear or is there an open question here? Okay, it seems clear so far, but you can always ask later. So, this is the main formula of the policy gradient method. I can now say, I know what is the derivative of my average return with respect to the parameters. It's just given by this formula where I sum over all times and I take the expectation value of the product of the return for the particular trajectory multiplied by this logarithmic derivative for this particular trajectory. So I'm emphasizing the particular trajectory because these AT and ST in here, these are the actions and states for a particular trajectory that I got when I ran my game 500 times. One of these trajectories at this point in time has the action AT and the state ST, and I'm evaluating the gradient exactly at this spot. And then I can do stochastic uh, gradient. Well, I should have written ascent. So. Uh, um, because I'm wanting to go up the reward. Uh, so I, uh, just as you learned it for neural networks, uh, I just have a learning rate eta and I walk up the gradient and I'm improving my average uh, return all the time. And of course, as usual, uh, this expectation value should have been taken over all trajectories. I cannot do that, but I'm Monte Carlo sampling it, so maybe I'm rolling out 20 trajectories and I'm taking the empirical average over these 20 trajectories. That's already good enough, and I'm taking one step of my uh, gradient ascent. Okay, and so now this is just a formula, but we can try to interpret it again. So what really is written down here is the following. Um, I have run my trajectory, I've noted down all the states and the actions, and by moving theta in the direction of this logarithmic gradient, I'm actually increasing the probabilities of taking these particular actions that were in my particular trajectory. Because if I do, if I move theta in the direction of the gradient of the probability or the logarithmic gradient doesn't actually matter, it's so monotonous, 
uh, I will increase these action probabilities. So it's exactly as I said in the beginning. If you have a high return trajectory where this capital R is large and positive, so to speak, uh, then you will move in the direction of increasing all the action probabilities that, of actions that you actually took. Now, um, you may wonder a little bit, uh, so what happens if, if R is always positive? Don't we always increase the action probabilities? But the point is simply, these probabilities are normalized, yeah? So if I'm increasing one and not increasing another so much, the other will automatically get suppressed. So, so it all works out in the right way. And it will be the case that those action probabilities will win that are associated statistically with the highest return. They will simply blow up the fastest, so to speak. Okay, so that's a policy gradient. Um, now here's a little side remark. Um, actually, you can simplify it a little bit, and sometimes this helps. So instead of multiplying with the total cumulative reward, the total return, you can also just take the return as counted from the given time step. So I, I've written down the formula here. So capital RT would just be summing over all immediate rewards, but only counting from T and not the earlier ones. Yeah? Capital R itself included everything. RT only includes those starting from T. And so why does this still work and actually give the same thing? Well, if you think about it, um, the rewards at earlier times, they are not influenced at all by the action I'm taking at time t. So to decide how to move the action probability for the action at time t, I do not need to know what were the rewards earlier because even if I take a completely different action next time uh, at time t in the next trajectory at time t, I will still, I would have gotten the same rewards uh, at earlier times, yeah. So the action at time t will not modify rewards at earlier times as a kind of causality. So why does this slightly modified expression help me sometimes? It certainly doesn't make a difference if the reward is only at the very end of my game, yeah? because then capital RT is the same as capital R and everything is the same anyway. Uh, but if I do indeed have this uh, sequence of little rewards accumulated over time, then uh, keeping only the uh, returns from the given point in time to the end of time will result in a quantity that has less fluctuations, and that's often helpful, yeah? The expectation value is the same in any case. I'm going in the right direction, but it's good to have a smaller variance of this because I'm estimating it, remember, from a, a finite number of trajectories. So it can be helpful. And then one final remark in this direction. There's also a thing that people call discounting. So uh, what you can do is you say, well, let me say I'm most interested in optimizing the immediate reward at this time step, and I'm already interested a little bit less in what happens the time step afterwards and the time step after that one. So what people do is, they rewrite this uh, future return, capital R, in the right-hand expression where they multiply with a small factor uh, to the power of the time that has elapsed. So uh, at t prime equals t, it's uh, gamma to the zero, so that's one. But uh, in the next time step, it's already a factor of gamma. The next time step is gamma squared, gamma to the third. And if gamma is a number less than one, it will suppress the influence uh, of uh, rewards that happen more or less uh, far in the future. Now, um, if you think about it, if gamma is really small, then you're only trying to optimize the immediate reward here and nothing else, yeah? So you're very short-sighted in your actions. <laughs> so instead of trying to win the game, you just want to get the next cookie, so to speak. And so, this is officially known as a greedy strategy, and of course we know that greedy strategies are bad, uh, because you may be too greedy and get a little bit reward now, but don't get a lot of reward later on. Yeah? So it's clear that the correct solution would be the non-greedy one, where gamma equals one, where I don't discount. 
but sometimes learning is a bit more stable and you have less fluctuations of the, of the gradient signal uh, if you do have a discounting. And so what people do is some, something intermediate, yes, uh, and maybe they can even change the discounting factor over time. Okay. Well, any, any questions about any of this? So yeah, so we have in principle, at least on paper, we have solved all our problems that we identified in the beginning. Well, we still have to see how good it works. <laughs> but we turn from discrete actions to these continuous probabilities and so on and so on, and we don't actually need a model of the environment. Okay, so now we can let our little robot run around, initialize with some action probabilities that do depend on its current location and tell me whether to move up or left or right. I can initialize them randomly. I run one trajectory, I note down the reward, uh, I run the next trajectory, I run 20 trajectories, I update my probabilities according to the formula we just saw, reinforcing those actions that were statistically correlated with high reward trajectories. And then uh, with the new probabilities, I run again trajectories and so on and so on. Okay. So now we want to see this in practice. And instead of going to a complicated example, the good thing if you enter a new topic and you want to learn about it is to find the simplest possible toy models that you can possibly think of, yeah, that are better than nothing, <laughs> so to speak, uh, like the harmonic oscillator or the two-level system or the particle in a box if we think of quantum mechanics. And so the challenge now for you again for the next five minutes would be, can you think up of a super simple toy example for RL, maybe formulated in the way we described it with states and actions and so on. So what would be your choice? And there is no one single correct answer. I will present one, uh, what I call a very simple toy model, but uh, I'm really interested in what you can come up with. So next five minutes, invent your simplest possible RL toy example.
Okay, maybe still one minute and then I will call for suggestions. Okay, so are there any suggestions? A really simple RL example. Or maybe not so simple, but what did you come up with? Yeah? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, finding the ground state of some quantum model. But uh, classical, okay, good. Some whatever, H of S equals blah, 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 some S, I, S, J, J, I, J, and so on. And how would you do that? Uh huh. How the energy changes, yeah. So the reward at time t is probably some of the energy change. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, good, yes. Okay, yeah, that, that could be something. It's an optimization task. It's split up into different little actions, and I'm probably observing maybe the whole thing, uh, the whole spin configuration. Okay. I don't consider that the simplest possible model, but yes, I like it actually. Yes? Tic tac toe, huh? So, yeah, a game, yes. Okay, good, yes. So, that's uh, interesting. So, that's already a little board game, so to speak, yes. With reward, I guess, depending on how you, how you do in the end, whether you win. Yeah, so that's actually, yeah, the state space is small enough that probably I can store things even still in a table, yes. Um, any other suggestions? I mean, there are no right or wrong answers, but, yeah. Okay, so that's the robot and the box. Um, uh, and you get a reward when you get the box, but uh, uh, what would be the observation in your, uh, in your case? Is the box placed randomly, for example? That's an interesting, one of the interesting questions. Oh, okay, so the robot is placed randomly. What does the robot know? Does it know its coordinates, so to speak, or not? Yes, it knows its coordinate and it has to learn, okay, if I'm, so to speak, at these coordinates left of the box, then I should move to the right, I guess. Yes, okay. Yeah, so um, I will give you an even simpler example. <laughs> um, so I claim it's the simplest reinforcement learning example ever. Um, so I do have a random walk and the only action that I care about is moving up or down so the only probability that I can change is really the probability of moving up because the other one is one minus that. And my return is simply where I end up in the end. So how large is the coordinate that I end up in the end? And you tell me immediately what's the optimal strategy. Yeah, always go up, yeah? So the probability of going up should be one. So we already know the solution but we want to see how policy gradient arrives at this solution. Yeah? Now, I should say this is really simple because 
you realize that the state space, the, the observation doesn't even enter the picture. So the agent is not even, we don't need to tell the agent where it is. There is only the action probability. So it's super simple. And we come to a more interesting example later, but it's already interesting enough. So the first question then is how would you parameterize the policy? So the pro policy here is just moving up or moving down. And since one probability is one minus the other, it's really just about parameterizing a single probability. So how would you do that? How would you parameterize that probability? Well, one choice is just to say this probability itself is my theta. Yeah? You could always do that. The problem with that is if this is theta and ranges between 0 and 1 and directly maps on the probability, then it could easily happen that in your gradient ascent you step out of the allowed range of values per theta and then you have to cut it and then it's shaky numerically so people don't like that. So uh, it would be better to have a parameterization of my probability that automatically stays between zero and one. And there are many choices. Um, if you have any suggestion. Hmm? Yeah, sigmoid, exactly, that, because that's much nicer. So I have a theta and I want something like this. It's between zero and one, so to speak. And so that's the probability as a function of theta. So the probability I'm talking about, pi theta, of the action going up would just be one divided by one plus e to the minus theta, so the usual sigmoid function. So if theta is large, this becomes zero, I just get one moving up. If theta is very negative, I get zero here, so I'm moving down. Yeah, so this is what we can do. So here's the policy, probability of moving up is the sigmoid. The return, as I said, is just how far you got at the end of the trajectory. Let's say we have capital T time steps, so that's clear. And then the reinforcement learning update I've just written down here. So it's again this logarithmic derivative of the action probabilities for this particular trajectory multiplied by the return for this particular trajectory and then summed over all times and averaged over all trajectories. So this is the, um, this is the update. And so uh, we can actually calculate things. So that's the beauty of this example. Everything can be done analytically. So that's why I introduce it. So for example, this logarithmic derivative, it's a very short calculation. Uh, you can uh, express the end result again in terms of this probability. So the logarithmic derivative is either one minus the probability if the action is up or minus the probability of up if the action was down, so okay. And then you can actually carry out the sum over all times of these logarithmic derivatives of the action probabilities for a particular trajectory. So this trajectory, remember, has action plus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, and so on. So it has a particular sequence of plus ones and minus ones. These are the steps that you take. But if you work it all out and just use the formulas above, then you realize the, you have a definite expression for that. Namely, the sum of all times of the logarithmic derivatives is just the number of steps that you took up in this particular trajectory minus n, that's the total number of time steps, times the probability to go up. And so n times the probability, that's of course the average number of steps I'm going up. And the first part is the actual number of up steps in this particular trajectory because that fluctuates from trajectory to trajectory. Yeah? So in a sense, this thing that is written down here teaches me how more I'm going up in this particular trajectory than on average. And remember, that's the thing that multiplies the return. So that's now a very interesting observation. So if we write down the actual update of the theta parameter, it's, I've written it down here for you, it's the expectation value, or the yeah, expectation value of a batch of trajectories, for example, uh, r, that's the return, times this um, difference that we just discussed between the actual number of up steps minus the average number of up steps. And so my question for you is, what happens to the up probability if I'm looking at a trajectory with more up steps, or say it differently. So let's say I have many different trajectories and I observe that the trajectories that on average have more sorry, the trajectories that have more up steps than average trajectories, 
they get a high return, which will actually be the case. Yeah? We know this already because our return is so constructed that we do prefer uh, trajectories that primarily go up. So what happens uh, to theta? So is this then positive or negative? So it's pretty easy to decide. It's positive, it's positive absolutely because this n up minus average is positive by definition. And so it goes along with the high rewards. So this delta theta even when averaged over many trajectories will be positive. And remember here, going up in theta means increasing the probability uh, for it to move up. And that's exactly what we want, right? So what will happen is we roll out many trajectories we observe that those trajectories that just by random fluctuations have a little bit more up steps, they get rewarded a little bit more. And because of that, the probability to go up increases. And so, um, yeah, this is just repeated here. And so then we can, for example, calculate what's really the average, um, the average, um, the average, RL update, so if I really average over millions of trajectories, let's say, and we can write down an explicit analytical expression for this, gen, uh, um, for this update, for this averaged update. Um, and what we will find is that, uh, for example, if I specialize to the case where the action probabilities are still 50-50, and I can evaluate this explicitly, and I'll find that, yes, of course, I'm moving up, just as we just discussed. I'm moving, uh, I'm increasing my probabilities. Here's the general calculation. Again, this would be a little bit homework exercise. But what we find is that the average step in theta in my gradient ascent will always be positive. I will always increase uh, my action probability go up. But it does depend on what's the current action probability. So I'm plotting here the outcome of this calculation, so the average update uh, plotted as a function of the uh, probability to go up. And you see I get the biggest changes when I'm still on the 50-50 side. And I get much smaller steps in theta, much smaller updates when I'm already close to the good solution, which is up probability is one. But I also get very small changes if I'm close to the bad solution, unfortunately. And the reason for this is also quite simple to understand. If I only show you trajectories that are going up, well, then you don't need to move anyway. But also, if I only show you trajectories that are going down, you never once encounter a trajectory that teaches me what would have happened if I had gone up. Yeah? You only see the bad stuff. And so you cannot even compare the things. And it's best if you're in the middle of it, if you have 50-50, because then you have a large variety of different trajectories that you're looking at, and you can very definitely say, oh yeah, going up, that really helps. So that's, that's nice of this example that you can interpret all these things. And then you can really run it, yeah? Then you can really run it. So this calculation, what we did uh, is, what's the average um, update to theta? What's the average update to the probability? But here, I've really run Monte Carlo simulations. So I've um, run through trajectories. I've updated my theta according to the reinforcement learning policy gradient uh, update rule. And then I've plotted how the probability of going up changes as a function of the training time, as a function of the number of trajectories that I went through. And I always started with 50-50. Yeah? So it's a completely unbiased random walk. But then you see that it moves up as it should and it eventually ends up at the right fixed point that is always move up. But what you can also see from this example is the fluctuations in learning can be pretty large, at least for the parameters that I chose here. So it even happens in this green trajectory that I already learned almost the correct strategy, and then, whoops, there is <laughs> some relatively catastrophic collapse back to smaller probabilities, and then I slowly go up again. So we can have strong fluctuations. That's, of course, an extreme example, but it's, it's teaching us something. Okay. Um, just a quick remark. Um, I want to finish up this example for today, and then uh, uh, the rest we continue tomorrow. 
uh, what you can also do in this beautiful analytical example, you can even calculate not what's the average update step, but what's the variance of the update, update step. Yeah? And how does that depend on the number of time steps in your trajectory and so on. And what you will find is that the, the average update here is plotted in blue. It scales like linear in the number of time steps. That's just the way it comes out. And the variance is much bigger as this green curve. It's, it's like the three half power of the number of time steps. So it's pretty bad. The fluctuations are really big, but we already saw this directly in the numerics. Now, um, of course, you can always suppress these fluctuations by running more trajectories, by averaging over a batch of trajectories. You run 100 trajectories, and automatically, if you average the gradient, you will do better and you will do better by a factor of one over square root of the number of trajectories in a batch, so that's not very surprising. Yeah? Um, but uh, I also want to mention here already that there are tricks that you can play, and that's a very interesting trick uh, that I'm now going to discuss in the last three minutes or so. So what you can do is you can say the following. This return is a little bit funny, right? I want to maximize the return so if you just shift the return always by the same constant, it shouldn't matter, right? So if, if one person gives me a return that ranges between five and seven, and the other person subtracts uh, three from each of these numbers, still the maximum will be the same, and probably my policy gradient should somehow evolve in the same way. Yeah? So I can shift around my return. And the first thing to realize is I can do that without any penalty. The average update will be exactly the same. So this is what I tried to write down here. I subtract from my return some constant b. So b is now really a constant. It doesn't depend on the trajectory. r does depend on the trajectory. b does not. It's just a constant. And the claim is um, that this is the same whatever I choose for b if b is a constant. And the proof for that is basically if b is a constant, I'm just taking this expectation value of the uh, logarithmic gradient, and I've written it down here again. But then you realize, oh, if I really sum over all uh, the trajectories and take this p times logarithmic gradient, I can basically undo this transformation that we did here, and I will realize that this is the gradient of the normalization sum. But the normalization sum is always 1, so the gradient is 0. Yeah? So that's a little mathematical detail, but it teaches me, yes, indeed, as I expected, if I take a constant and subtract it from my return, nothing changes. But that's not quite true. What does not change is the expectation value of this. What can change is the variance. And so that's one of those tricks where you keep the expectation value the same. So on average, you move in the same direction, which is good. Otherwise, you would be doing something wrong but you are reducing the variance. If you pick the right B, you can actually reduce the variance. And you can also find the optimum B. You can look at these formulas and say, what's the variance of this whole thing? And then let me find the minimum of this with respect to B. And then you get an expression for what should be your optimal choice of B. I will not present it to you. It, if you are really interested in learning more about reinforcement learning, that would be a little homework. Look at these expressions, take the variance see uh, how b should look like. There should be expressions where the uh, logarithmic derivative squared should appear and so on, just as a little hint. Uh, I will not show it here because the, while the concept is one that is very important, and we will come back to it tomorrow, uh, of subtracting such a constant, um, the, the particular solution here is not the one that is actually used. Yeah. OK. And so, that really can help you. So this optimal baseline, when I do the subtraction trick, uh, suppresses the variance down to the red curve, which is not only smaller here in this picture, but it also scales differently with a number of time steps. Yeah. So that really helps. And so, um, mm, yes, please. Mm, yeah, then, then really nothing happens because that just multiplies everything and then uh, I will just maybe take the smaller steps in theta, but that is like changing my learning rate, so it wouldn't help me so much. Okay, now I have to think. 
I still wanted to give people a homework, and so I should still explain the homework. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so, homework. <laughs> um, here's the second simplest uh, RL example ever. Now we want to have a situation where there is an actual state, an actual observation coming in, so the probabilities do depend on something. And I will define for you the little problem. Again, I have a random walker. Maybe in this case, it can just move up or stay on the same site. So plus one or zero, that's the actions. But now there's a particular target site that is randomly chosen in each run of the game. And it will be rewarded according to the number of time steps that it remains on this target site. You can already guess what's the best strategy. The best strategy is to move very quickly to the target site and then stay there. In order for it to have a chance of doing this, it should be told whether it is on the target site. Yeah? So the observed state should be, say, zero or one, depending on whether it is on the target site or not. And so also the action probabilities, moving or not moving, do depend on the state. So we have two different actions and two different states that it can observe. And the homework I suggest is <laughs> that you try out to implement the reinforcement learning update that we discussed for this kind of example. First, you have to parameterize your actions, maybe in a similar way as here, only there will be more of them because they de do depend on the state. Um, and then you run these trajectories with a random number generator, of course, drawing probabilities according to these parameterized probabilities and doing the update according to the RL rule that you learned. And that's a little Python program or so that you can program and you can team up, I hope. So, yeah, that, but there's still a question. Uh, so, but the agent needs to know what is the target site because otherwise it will never have a chance to do the right thing. Otherwise it will always have to move around randomly or maybe deterministically. But since the target site will change randomly from run to run of the game, the agent needs to have some indication whether it is on the target site. Okay, if the target site were fixed from game to game, uh, then it could work, but only if you, if you give another kind of state to, the, to this walker. For example, the, if it starts out from the same position always, then it should be told, for example, the number of time steps that have been elapsed, because internally it would have to count, okay, one, two, three, now I should stop. Yeah. So whatever game you define, you need to think a little bit about what is the minimum observation that this poor agent needs to actually solve the task. Oh, um, I see, okay, that's a, that's a more elaborate thing. So, um, no, but that, that is much more, uh, that is much more complicated. So basically, if someone only teaches you afterwards, okay, you did plus five or so, um, then in order to know what you should do next time, you should have a memory of the trajectory you actually did, and so then you can start to guess, oh yeah, I got five time steps on the correct target. Let me look at my trajectory. Oh, there was this uh, uh, time period where I remained uh, stationary for time, five times. So I think. You need to sit down and think about it, but I think it's a much more complicated version of the game. Yeah. Okay, so I hope otherwise that's clear. Uh, it's a doable homework, but it's really fun. Team up with someone, try to program this in Python, and then we meet again tomorrow. Like, oh, uh, works out. Um, 
if there are a few, if there's one or two urgent questions, we might still accommodate that. Otherwise, I would suggest then uh, to meet uh, tomorrow morning. Again, I think it's again your turn in the morning tomorrow. And yeah, have a nice evening and fun uh, programming your walk out.